So I thought I'd start with a, a little story. Guy walks into a library, says, I'll have cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. <laughs> Librarian says, sir, you're in a library. He says, oh, I'll have cheeseburger, <laughs> fries, and a Coke. I got my laugh out, that's it. <laughs> I consider myself an authority on failure. I've been doing restaurants on my own with a group, when I say on my own, uh, not working for someone, for 46 years. During that time, We've done over 260 restaurants. I have a philosophy that if I'm 70% right when I do a restaurant, I'm doing well, provided that 30% gets worked on starting immediately. So I've probably made more mistakes, according to my calculations, than anyone that I know in the restaurant business. Failures are a big part of the conflict in terms of the conflict and change. Conflict has many faces. Failures, stagnation, personal problems, going too fast, having the wrong associates. Even success can be a conflict that I'll talk about a little later. So when I started thinking about conflict and change, to me, the important word was change. In this fast-growing, crazy, ever-changing world of restaurants, change often is what keeps you afloat keeps you abreast. I started thinking about the ability to make change. There's one word that you need to be able to do it. And that word is confidence. If you stay confident, you could make change and you could be flexible. And I often think the most rigid people are usually the most insecure. So then I start thinking, you know, as you get older, in the, and I'm an old restaurateur, and as you get older in business, it's much like a pitcher in baseball. When you're young, you throw the hell out of the ball. When you get older, you have less energy, less strength but hopefully more wisdom. And one of the things that I've tried to do is to boil things down in real simple ways for first that I could understand and also so I could teach. And one of the things I've realized is that everybody out here in the audience, every individual restaurateur, you are the center of all things in your life. Everything happens in your life because of you. When I look at a restaurant that has a problem, I just look at the leaders and say, what are they going through? What don't they know? What are they missing? And so your personal development becomes very crucial if you want to lead an organization that's growing. What I also realize is that it's much easier to work on the intellectual part. You know, a chef works on a better recipe for a particular dish. But I believe that the emotional part of your life is what often determines your success. 
And you can't develop anyone else unless you first develop yourself. And your insecurities often lead to your problems. So when I understand, or when I see individuals, partners, managers, and so forth with certain insecurities, I almost could tell where they're going to wind up. So again, when things aren't going well, look, onto your, look into yourself. What I found is that it's extremely important to surround yourself with the right people. I think that's been maybe one of my strengths. Um, took me a long while to figure it out. I went through a lot of bumps, bruises. I remember 1976, I think it was, maybe 77, and my son, we had, I don't know, six restaurants, and a group of us went to Cornell. I was not much of a student, but I was very impressed with the kids in our organization talking about how the best and the brightest restaurant kids were coming out of Cornell, and we went there, and it was a disaster for me. I'm a very direct person. I was probably even more direct then. And when I'd interview people, if I liked them, I told them why I liked them. And if I didn't like them, I would tell them what I didn't like. I wasn't cruel, but I hoped to be insightful. I hoped that people could walk away and say, well, I know I didn't get the job, and maybe I can improve on something. Well, I think they reported me to the dean or something. I don't know. <laughs> there were a couple kids that really had a difficult time hearing what I thought of them. It was one person's opinion. Maybe Cornell kids aren't used to that. I don't know. They think <laughs> they think they were very special, I guess. You know, hard school to get into. Anyway, the bottom line is we took six of those kids back to Chicago. We had about seven restaurants, six, whatever we had then. And we knew we had a lot of growth coming, and everybody convinced me that having these Cornell kids who were 22 years old or so come into the organization would be wonderful. Bottom line is, two and a half years later, none of them are there. None of them are with us. Some left, some we wanted to leave. But it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it helped me start thinking about what I needed in people. And I certainly realized if we were trying to grow leaders, I didn't want to start with 22-year-olds. Maybe by accident some can get in there. And I later found out that I had much more success with 28, 29, 30, 31-year-olds who were a little bit more serious that didn't have to go through a lot of the things that the 22-year-olds went through. I remember one of the things that the 22-year-olds old two-year-olds two went through was they either were too tough on the servers or they were on their side 100%, they became best friends. And there were a series of things like that that made me realize that's not who I want at that time. And so what I did was I developed a little matrix of what I look for in people that are the most successful people in our organization, or will be the most successful. And the first thing was, I like people that are bright. You don't have to be Mensa, but I like people that are with it. I love people that are driven. I like people that are aware. Humbleness ranks real high with me. I find people that are humble often have their feet on the ground and are easier to coach. And once again, the single most important thing that I would take when I was looking for an individual and trying to project their success within our organization is somebody that's confident. Even young kids could be confident in little ways if you know what to look for. I don't know how many of you are parents. Martha, my wife, and myself, we have three terrific kids. 
And I learned a lot from watching my wife develop our children. And I think a lot of people in the restaurant business think you hire good people and you train them and you're done. And my feeling is that you're never done. Hire, train, develop, keep people happy, keep people motivated, show people that you care. And as you build that team, you build the organization. I want to talk a little bit about growing too fast. It's hard being a young entrepreneur. As a group, we're very competitive. Add to that, when you're lucky enough to become a young star that the press recognizes, and the press is all over you, and you're getting accolades, I guarantee you, a lot of the young guys don't even feel the instant press that they're getting. I know it happened to me. And offers start coming from all over. That's where I think success can hurt you. And I'm going to tell you a story of what happened to me. So we open our first restaurant. And I'm thinking, this is really going to be one of the most special restaurants ever. It was so different from anything that Chicago had seen in the early 70s. When I was 20 years old, myself and a dear friend of mine, we had $3,500 between us. And we took an ad out in the Chicago Tribune that said, inventions wanted will finance. And after about seven, eight days, we had 200 letters. We were going crazy. We said, oh my God, we're going to be wealthy. We're gonna... We didn't know what the hell we were doing. And we narrowed it down to a couple people. And then we narrowed it down to one. We talked to both of them on the phone. And we narrowed it down to one. And I met the guy for the first time going out for a lunch downtown Chicago. And I remember what I ordered. It was spaghetti and meat sauce and mashed potatoes and gravy. 20 years old, that seemed right to me. <laughs> and this guy that we were meeting with was appalled at how I was eating. He brought his own lunch with him. And I remember he had his, a little jar with a natural sugar and apples and stuff like that. It was sort of disgusting to me how, <laughs> how he was eating. This guy was a middle manager um, at the post office. And his goal, remember that we're talking about over 50 years ago, and his goal was to be able to quit his job so he could write about the correlation of proper eating and health. I never even dreamed about something like this. And I wound up being fascinated by this guy. And he would take me and my partner to these goofy health food shops. They were sort of dirty and not very appealing. But he kept talking. And it made an impact, even though we weren't very successful in being able to promote his inventions which were better than our ability to do something with them. It left, um, well, it, it resonated with me. And when we opened up our first restaurant, believe it or not, we had the organic meal of the day. We had a macrobiotic meal of the day. We had a lot of vegetarian things. And you can get a hamburger. So I'm thinking this is going to be like revolutionary. It's going to work. And I will tell you, zero. The first week, we did like $2,200 worth of business. And our payroll was $2,000. So you can imagine where we were at. I did not come from money. Second week, third week, fourth week, fifth week. I have never felt so depressed except for the days my best friend and partner died, who I started the restaurant with, and my parents died. Like magic, 
Two and a half months after we opened, one day it was a quarter full, and literally the next day, I remembered so vividly, there was a waiting line, and the place was up for grabs. And my partner talked me into retiring. 30 years old, we moved to California, he buys a house, and I'm retired for four months. And every day I'm playing basketball and I'm saying, hey, this isn't for me. I, I don't like retirement. It was a great lesson to learn early on. I will never retire. So I went back to work, met a young man who was a chef from Europe. We opened the second restaurant and it was more successful than the first. Not that it got more recognition or did more business, but he was a better operator than I was. And he, um, he just made more money, and I loved it. So now I know I'm not gonna be retired. We've got two successful restaurants. By the way, my goal was to make $15,000 a year, and we surpassed that. We opened up three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And you know what? I made less money than I did with the first two. I had gotten married to Martha Whittemore, Martha Whittemore Melman now. She was the vice president of a college. And the truth of the matter was, Martha was making more money than me. I was the poster boy in Chicago, all these things coming my way, people saying, oh my God, look at what he's doing. And by the way, every restaurant was busy. It wasn't like they weren't working. And what I realized then, and what I learned, is that along with growth has to be a great foundation. I neglected the foundation part. Here is maybe one of the most important things I've ever learned in business. My partner died in 1981. It was a tragic loss for me. He was my everything. I've often said that without him, I never would have accomplished what I did. It was funny because he didn't know the restaurant business. Somebody once said to him, what do you do in the restaurant? He says, pretty simple. Richard takes care of the restaurants, and I take care of Richard. That's what he did. He got me into therapy. He got me thinking in ways I was sort of wild and goofy, and he was calming to me. He was everything. So it's a few years after he passes away, and I meet a guy that's a top-flight realtor with a big company, and we had been thinking potentially of going out of Chicago, and he said, let me take you on a little trip, show you some of our malls, teach you a little bit about the real estate business. I said, sounds great, and so we went. I'm thinking that he's just a real estate guy. Turns out he was a psychologist and a social worker, and he got this opportunity to do real estate. He wasn't making enough money to support his family, and so that's what he did. And we're out and we're talking and talking and talking. We went out for dinner the first night. And he was a pretty interesting guy, pretty amazing guy. And he said, you know, I have a feeling for you. I like what you have to say. I like how you're thinking. I like what you're doing. I want you to add something to a journal that I'm doing. I said, what's that about? And he said, peace of mind. Never thought about peace of mind. And I said, well, do I have time to think about it? I don't even know what it means to me. And he said, yeah, go home, take a month, take two months, whatever it is, tell me when you're ready, write it out, and I'm gonna enter it into my journal. Think about it yourself what you need for peace of mind. And I say that because that's maybe the best way I know to work with conflict, to understand yourself 
and to realize what gives you peace of mind. Now, there are a lot of personal things that I need in terms of having peace of mind. But I'm going to tell you what I boiled down for myself in the restaurant business to keep me to have peace of mind. I do not want to be the biggest. That has never been my goal. I clearly do not want to be the richest. I do not want to be the most well-known. I just want to be the best that I could be. In sports, there's always somebody bigger, faster, better. And it's sort of true in life. And you drive yourself crazy when you try comparing yourself all the time. And so, just being the best that I could be has been sort of a lifesaver for me. I want to quickly talk about some of the things that I've learned. Everything starts for me with food. If I don't get goosebumps, I usually don't want to do the idea. People call me all the time with crazy ass ideas. <laughs> I always say to myself, look at all the things I've done. Why don't they call somebody who hasn't done anything? You know, what are they thinking about me for? But it starts with the food. It makes it very simple. If I don't like the food, if I'm not excited about it, I don't do the project. What I said before, work on yourself before you can develop others. No question that our success is directly tied to the development of our leaders. Spend quality time with the people. I was with a very up-and-coming restaurant star on the West Coast. We had lunch about a month, a month ago out on the West Coast. And he said to me, what do you do when all the managers have problems and this and that? And I said, I make time. I said, that's what leaders are supposed to do. You're supposed to organize yourself. I don't care if it's 20 minutes a day where you could devote to something like that, but it's extremely important. I said, you can't slough them off. So it takes time and effort. Working through problems together builds something that I think is very special. Restaurant tourists use your passion. I think passionate, and I think it's very important. Be passionate about what you do. When you love something, there's often an aura of joy that surrounds you. And I believe passion is contagious. And as a side note, I love passionate people. I don't care what they're passionate about. Passionate people excite me. Be honest and be direct with your people not with malice or control or trying to, or with power, trying to control them in any way is not my, my goal. It's just being honest so they could be better. And I think people could tell when it comes from your heart. And one of the things that I found that's very important, when there is a problem, you have a new employee and there is a problem, don't let it slip when something happens early. Confront them early. Set it straight right off the bat. If it's the first day and they're doing something wrong, be real direct. Don't say, eh, maybe they'll catch on. At least that's worked for me. I like people who listen. You learn a lot when you listen. I learn from all different types of people. People that are not good at listening usually think they know it all. Stay humble. In business, there's always more to learn. Be optimistic. If you want to be a leader, the bottom line is you need to be positive and upbeat. You can't be negative all the time. Here's something that a lot of people have debated, and I feel very strongly about this. The customer is usually right, not always right. Anybody that says the customer is always right, you take a thousand people. You think that a couple of them shouldn't be locked up? I mean, 
I mean, there are crazy ass people out there. I will tell you the one thing I can't tolerate is anyone that mistreats our people. I have no tolerance. And my average is one or two people a year. I tell them they're not wanted here. I always ask them where they like to go. Where are their restaurants where they're well taken care of? And they tell me, I say, go there. Why aggravate yourself? Why aggravate me? Return, return phone calls, small thing, very important. As you get more successful, I think you have to be more organized and realize how important it is to do little things that are right. And you know what? You never know who it is you're not returning a call to. I remember five, six years ago, I saw a product that I thought was terrific. And it gave me an idea. And I called this woman. One week went by, two weeks went by, three. It's about four weeks, and I got a call back from her. I called her back 20 minutes afterwards. She wasn't in. And another three weeks went by until she called. And I told my assistant, I've lost interest. Probably would have been $100,000 worth of business that we would have given her over a year or two. And in, more importantly, I had an idea that we could have worked on together. So you never know who you're not calling back. To get big, one of the keys to my success has been, I think, very small. I always say to our people, inch by inch, life's a cinch. Yard by yard, it gets quite hard. I take things and I break them into small little areas. You know why? Success is built in a snowballing effect. I don't want to have a bunch of people failing in their tasks, so I'd rather give them something small and let them keep building, and it works for me. I look for craveable food done extremely well. I'm 10 years old living in Chicago with my parents, obviously, living in Logan Square. My mother takes me to Bright Supermarket. She goes shopping. I'm walking down the aisle, and the guy says, hey, son, would you like a little taste of something? I didn't even remember. I didn't even know what it was. You know what it was? It was pizza. It's the first time we ever had pizza. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> now it's a lot of years later, 60-plus years later. I still get that excited about pizza. So looking for craveable food done extremely well has really worked for me. That's all I can tell you. Leadership is emotional. Management is more of a science. I believe everybody in this room can learn to be a better leader. Leadership is, can be taught. Eighty percent of our success takes place before we ever open the door of our restaurants. The idea, the location, the lease, the people, the food, everything. I spend a tremendous amount of time before the restaurant ever opens. Success is temporary. I don't care for the Yankees. The Cubs, Michael Jordan, I don't care who you are. There's no such thing as success forever. I'm never done. I never take it for granted, and I'm never done trying to improve. I always try my hardest. There's a lot of things that I will never attempt, but once I do, I can't tell you how hard I work. Follow through, follow through, lack of urgency to me, or lack of follow through, lack of urgency to me is like not hustling in sports. Everybody can hustle. You don't need a special skill to do something quickly. I've never made money the number one goal. We have a consulting division. 
And one of the things that I have found working with some of the big companies we've worked with is they get out of kilter. You know, one quarter, they'll say the most important thing is that we have better food. And all of a sudden, the profits go down. And the next quarter, they get blamed for lack of profits. And they work on profits, and the food goes down. And in life, as well as business, I think balance is a very important thing in life. And uh, money is not the number one thing, but it's important. It's an important part of that balance. The last thing, the last couple things I want to say, the nice thing about business, there's always an answer to the problems. You might not know it, You might not like it, but there's always an answer. And when I think of this conference, I'm thrilled with this conference. Anthony and Will, I think you've hit on something that's spectacular. My kids said to me, and they're pretty fussy, they're coming back next year and they're bringing some of their key people. And I love it. And I think... A place like this is where you find some of the answers. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today.